Well, I'm joined on the line, I hope, now by Diocesan Secretary Oliver Hume. Uh, he does financial management uh, and manages a team of 40 people for the bishop down at, at the Bristol Diocese. Hi, Oliver, and welcome to The Politics Show. Hi, Tony. We've got uh, coming up next month something that I always report on on here, which is the Merchant Ventures Charter Day. Uh, maybe you could just tell us, because there's been a bit of a debacle, hasn't there, over over it, this, uh, particularly since Bishop Mike uh, was talking about Edward Colston and speculation about his business dealings. Do you think that that one has uh, gone away now, or do you think we'll still have some uh, problems with the bishop being accused of giving some kind of credence to this idea that Edward Corson wasn't a slave trader or wasn't a bad chap? Um, I, I can't imagine why uh, he would be... Um, that, that that idea would be promoted. Um, I, I'm not... Oh, obviously, if people want to make an issue of uh, this situation, that is that is up to them. Bristol has a past that it needs to come to terms with. It has uh, figures in our past who have been complicit uh, with the slave trade, and we need to come to terms with that in terms of uh, what people say about the bishop and what he might say or might have said, uh, which was, as far as I can work out, uh, largely misreported. Um, uh, that That's up to them. I can't predict what they might be saying, but I don't think he will be saying anything that would... Uh, uh, in any way justify any, anyone to do with the slave trade. I mean, he's, he's, the text of what he said is pretty clear. He was talking about the morality of Edward Colston's business dealings, and in, twice he actually said that there was speculation about it. Well, that does sound, doesn't it, like uh, he's uh, saying that the, uh, his connection with the slave trade, there was some, con uh, some kind of speculation there. Um, the Bishop of Bristol was very clear that, 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 that Edward Colston had a connection with the slave trade. He's been very clear about that. So why is he telling hundreds of first uh, school children then that it's speculation? I can't comment on that because this is a, a few years ago and I, I haven't got the text in front of me. Um, and I suppose, to be fair, I should ask you how long you've been in the job because this may have been before you started. Uh, I've been in the job for two years. Oliver Hume, you are a Di diocesan secretary uh, looking after management of a team of 40 people for the bishop. Thanks very much for joining us on The Politics Show. Thank you, Tony. We are Bristol's first community radio station. BCFM 93.2. Now I'm joined in the studio by Christine Townsend and also Dr Roger Ball from Bristol Radical History Group. I just wonder, Christine, firstly from you, what you make of uh, what you've just heard there. What about Sir Michael on the Mount, the church, or...? Particularly uh, on what we heard about the speculation over Edward Colston, because, I mean, it does seem that, uh, that Oliver was taking over uh, as a diocesan secretary, more or less, as we had all this, uh, uh, the revelations two years ago about what had been being said to these school children in the church. Uh, yeah, I, find, I mean, I'm sure that Oliver has read a number of the uh, press cuttings because it was quite big two years ago after the, um, the uh, bishop was recorded um, surreptitiously in the cathedral doing, uh, saying what he was saying to the children. Um, I find it interesting that Oliver says that we need to uh, come to terms with the past. I would suggest that the cathedral needs to come to terms with the past and... Um, they need to present Edward Colston to children or anybody else that they're talking to about Edward Colston for the, the slave trader that he was. You can't continue to repeat that the man was a philanthropist but not also then fill in all the other gaps around what else the man did and where that money came from. I suppose the other aspect here, of course, is the merchant venturer's uh, control of many of our schools and certainly influence on the governing bodies of them too. Oh yeah, the merchant venturers we know are sponsors of a number of academies. They um, they well, they sponsor uh, Colston Girls School. They sponsor the Merchants Academy, which were two of the state schools that were in the cathedral on that day where the children um, were going to school. But members of the merchant venturers also sit on the cathedral charter, um, and you know they're they're involved with St Mary Redcliffe. Um, they're 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 very good friends with the diocese of Bristol and Pete and the bishop and the dean. Let's put it that way. 
Now, also know that you've been involved in a, a sort of letter writing campaign on negotiations over trying to make sure that this doesn't happen again. The idea that uh, hundreds of school children, by the way, the Evening Post completely wrongly reported it, or the Bristol Post, whatever they <laughs> like to call themselves, saying there were scores of school children. Well, I was in there at the time, and there were hundreds of school children. The place was absolutely packed with school kids. Uh, and the, the point really being that these children don't have any options as to whether to be there or not, and there they are being lectured on history. By by the bishop in error. Yeah, well, the parents would have to sign a form to say that presumably they're allowed to go to this particular trip on the charter day. Um, but those children have no choice over what the, the bishop chooses to say to them. Um, but And th- also, you know, after the, after the ceremony, they'll all be offered a bun named after Edward Colston. And uh, then the pictures are taken of the children throwing the buns in the air. And then those pictures are used on new- newsletters for the school and website promotional material. Um, so even if the children didn't necessarily listen to every word that the bishop said to them, they'll certainly want to have that Colston bun. And that's kind of the point, really, for me, is um, the way in which it's presented and giving children, giving children cakes, I think, is actually uh, really very underhand. Well, I mean, the children won't say so. They'll probably say it's great. But in a way, it's kind of PR, isn't it? It's a sort of PR exercise for the merchants, a kind of whitewashing ex- exercise for Edward Colston. Uh, well, I would agree, and the merchants are in there with them as well, and it's part of um, some, some kind of initiation ceremony, I'm going to almost suggest that it is, um, as part of becoming what it is to be part of civil life in Bristol. Um, and you're very lucky, and it's a very special event, and you should be privileged to have been invited to this particular event. Well, I'm interested to know what, how and uh, what the schools, um, A, tell the parents about what's actually going on, and B, the education that the children get around it, because if that's what's happening if that's the only time they're getting a cake about Edward Colston I know I've talked to children for a long time that's the bit they remember one of the uh, uh, the questions that I know you've asked in the, the letter you've publicly published now that you sent I think it was to the Dean maybe you could just um, tell us what was main what were the main points you were in there well uh, what we've asked really for the Dean is to um, to let public public publicly publish what it is that they're actually going to do this year because they've agreed to make some kind some concessions because the dean when we met with him denied any knowledge um that he was aware that colston buns were being given to the children which i find amazing but surely look the main main thing here is the text of what the bishop is saying to these school children these school children uh, are are being told something by the bishop and yet he seems that he wants to keep it secret he wants to keep everybody out of the church doesn't sound like a normal kind of cathedral practice put some flesh on that what that actually means from a historical point of view i mean there is this kind of perception that the the story of edward colston is a story which is difficult to, to analyze historically that the evidence isn't really there that nobody quite knows where colston got his money from and that somehow he may or may not have been involved in the slave trade well to be honest from you know having studied the sources that's complete complete nonsense really what the bishop said that there was speculation let's get it straight about with colston right we're not just talking about somebody who made a lot of money out of the slave trade in the 17th century in particular we're talking about somebody who actually was the second in command of the most important organisation in the British Empire for the trading of slaves, which was the Royal African Company. So Colston wasn't some bit player. He wasn't somebody who just invested in slavery or, 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 or put some money in at some point in his life. Edward Colston ran the slave trade for Britain. He was in that position in the 1680s and 1690s in the, in the Royal African Company. So it's very important to get that straight. A lot of people made money out of the slave trade, including Edward Colston. But Edward Colston ran it, and that's the point. And that's why Edward Colston is a major, major issue in the city. Um, you know, I think there's a famous book written in the 1920s um, which first kind of exposed Edward Colston uh, by Reverend Wilkins. And he made the point in that book that there were hundreds of people who should have been remembered uh, as being the city fathers and city mothers rather than Edward Colston. And he actually brought to the surface this strange cult, almost fetish around Edward Colston to the exclusion of all these other people who've done great things in the city. And for that, he was, um, actually, he's, he was actually targeted by a lot of the great and the good in the city, the wealthy, um, after he wrote that book. But that was the first time it really started to break into the public domain, that really Edward Colston is not so much to be celebrated. In fact, there were lots of other people who should be.
so was it just the slave trade that he was involved in? No, he traded in lots of goods, but his his key the key bit where he made his money was two is in two ways really. One was through slave trading, but he then took that money and acted as a money lender. So, for example, he was invited to join the Merchant Ventures in in, in Bristol in the 1680s after he'd made a two thousand pound loan to the City Corporation. So he was somebody who had significant. Uh, banking power in the sense of money lending power and he multiplied the money that he made out of the slave trade through la- through lending and a quite a ruthless money lender as well uh, why is he such a sort of almost cult like I, I would i think i agree with you it's a sort of you know, pictures of him everywhere and yeah. yet and the idea is to try and turn this person who is profiting from human misery into someone who's like one of the greatest people in history why why is that happening well i think there are two two things we can grab here. One of them we're researching at the moment, a team of us are actually researching and there's this very, very curious anomaly about Edward Colston. So Edward Colston was involved in two organisations at the same time. So he was Deputy Governor of the Royal African Company, which had a monopoly on the slave trade. That meant that they were the only ones that could trade and there were sort of a couple of hundred investors you know, very wealthy investors involved in it. Meanwhile, all around the country, organisations such as the Merchant Ventures wanted to get their finger into the, the pie of this vile trade, and they campaigned publicly for 20 years against the Royal African Company, the Merchant Ventures, to get into this slave trade. They wanted to break it open, break the monopoly, and make so they could make a lot of money. And it's very strange that Edward Colston could be in both camps at the same, same time. In fact, he eventually left the Royal African Company and joined the other side. So, as there's a lot of speculation now, and it is speculation because the evidence is not. This is the complete. correct use of the word, Bishop Mike. Uh. Yeah, <laughs> this is <laughs> exactly. There is speculation about the fact that maybe Edward Colston was a very, very useful person for the people, uh, for the Merchant Ventures, in terms of like uncovering what the Royal African Company were up to and how they could undermine them, which they did. Because in 1698, the Royal African Company lost its monopoly. Uh, we wonder whether Colston had something to do with that. And then after that, the, sl- the number of slaves that were being shipped in Britain went up by a factor of five, and a lot of people, or a lot of a small number of wealthy people in Bristol, made an awful lot of money out of the slave trade. So we wonder whether they kind of fate, you know, they, you know, their fetishes over Colston because he made them extremely rich. That's one suggestion. The second suggestion is is that. The, the, the city needed a figure, the, the great and the good in the, in the city needed a figure to unite the city, particularly in the late 19th century, when you had mass demonstrations, strikes, um, you had the cavalry set on the streets to break up all these demonstrations of people who wanted democracy and socialism. So there was an attempt to try and unify the city around what the people like the Merchant Ventures regarded as somebody who was respectable, and that was Edward Colston. So that statue you see in down in the centre, that was put up in 1895. It's very recent. It's not some old bit of architecture. It's something very recent that was put there by by the by the wealthy in Bristol. What about this fact, Roger, that the uh, merchant venturers today uh, have got this immunity from having to publish accounts, being under a royal charter? Because it does, you know, doesn't really sit very well with an organisation which has so much power and owns so much land in the city for them to not to have to do the basic things that most ordinary business people would have to. Well, that's right, and it is, it's this kind of strange connection between sort of the idea of the corporation and, you know, the, the kind of, and, and the, the rights that come around with the charter that protect these people. And so they're able to move, in a sense, behind a sort of veil. Um, and I think, you know, with all organisations that claim to have some kind of civic power responsibility, they need to be completely transparent. I mean, that's obvious. So uh, as far as I'm concerned, I'd like to see the merchant ventures wound up. They probably should have been wound up several hundred years ago. Well, they probably would disagree with that. But what about this move into things like uh, education? This is a more modern uh, thing. But also, of course, we've got merchant ventures at the helm of our two big National Health Service trusts, which spend around about a million uh, sorry, a billion pounds of our public money every year. Well, I mean, first of all, as I said, just from a historical point of view, I find it an embarrassment that such an organisation still exists, like considering the role they played in, in promoting the slave trade and making money out of it. That's my first point, but regardless well, I mean, of that, how the hell they could get involved in the rest of this is a mystery to me, right? but maybe Christine could comment on that. She's a bit more of an expert on that than me. Um, well, I uh, became interested in the Merchant Venturers because uh, as a teacher, I was teaching at the academy where the Merchant Venturer became the chair, the first academy in Bristol. And since then, look, they have, they have officially sponsor two other academy trusts, but they're also involved in other academies. And 
the idea that you can have individual merchant, merchant venturers and the merchant venturers as an, as an organisation running our schools, yet we don't know wh what they invest in, I find very, very disturbing. I want to know what the merchant venturers as an organisation are investing their money in, because if they're investing their money in, in securities or arms wep and weapons, as we might otherwise know them as, then I don't think they're fit people to be running schools. I don't think they're fit people to be running hospitals and they need to open their books it's only the privy council that are that are in a position to actually look at the um, financial accounts of the merchant venturers um, because they've got this royal charter and transparency has got to be the way in which we as members of the public and taxpayers understand who's running our public services well, they are, to a certain extent, transparent once a year, aren't they, when they come down to the cathedral, troop in and troop out again and uh, bring all those school children with them to hear a lecture from the bishop. Uh, surely there is uh, there's any group of people, merchant ventures or anybody, have got every right to get together and organise. Um, well, I, don't, I think the point about it is, is that there's a difference between open and democratic forms of organisation in the city around, you know, as I said, issues around civic power and the way the city is represented. And I don't think this organisation is open or democratic. So I don't think it should be taken on any of that role, regardless of getting involved in education. I mean, I know that, you know, there's an attempt to try and privatise education or open the free market in education. But I don't think that these people should really be involved in that, especially considering they have somewhat chequered history Christine surely everybody has a right to get together to form an organisation to meet to do what they want effectively I mean you're, what you're saying in a way is that there's that the, the, the is anti-democratic uh, uh, I mean, actually it's Roger that said it that the merchant venturers shouldn't be allowed to exist in their present form what do you make of that um from a personal level, I've got no issue with, you know, old men getting together and having dinner somewhere, OK? The, the issue I have is that these are individuals and, and as a group, they are in, hu they are in massively uh, powerful positions within the city and therefore within the country as well because they've also got these huge links with London and I would imagine the rest of the country, uh, other parts of the country. That's the issue I have with it. And when it becomes that these people also have control over our of how our public money is spent and how our children are educated and how our health services run, then it does become everybody's business because these are services that we pay for as taxpayers. Thursday the 10th of November is this year, but it's the 10th of November every year, Roger. Uh, I mean, they're out in the open. What's the problem? Well, the problem is, is that you have to challenge these things. I mean, you have to certainly have to challenge the, the question about celebrations of Edward Colston. I mean, in our negotiations with, with the cathedral and with Colston Girls' School, for example, over, over the commemoration day, um, one of the issues that came up is, is that we've got a cathedral making a statement, the dean made a statement, that, um, that they would not in any way countenance a celebration of someone like Edward Colston. Yet at the same time, they're having their, 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 their own, in the cathedral themselves, they have these, these days and it was very clear I mean the, the head of um, the head of Colston Girls School uh, made it very clear in a letter to parents last year that actually this was a celebration of Edward Colston so we've got a lot of confusion here and I think that's the point is that we've got to come out in the open now and, and, and clear this up you know is it right to go around celebrating somebody who was involved directly in organising the slave trade? And isn't it time to move on? And, you know, this is not some kind of let's wreck Bristol. I've lived here most of my life now. And, you know, I, 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 there's a lot of people in this city who want to see some changes around things like that. And there are some great historical figures in the his city's history that are completely lost and have been smothered by the image of Edward Colston. OK, Roger, go for it. Who would you like to see uh, celebrated more in the city? Well, I'd start with changing the name of the Colston Hall, right, to Wolfston Hall, after St. Wolfston. He was the patron saint of, of peasants and vegetarians. But what is he famous for? He's coming to Bristol in the 11th century, he raised the Bristol mob, and he stopped the slave trade in the city. At the time, there was a whole load of slave trading with Ireland going on. And, this is you know, the white, white slave trade. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. I mean, the slave trade, the merchant ventures weren't cheesy. I'll come on to that in a minute. But, but you know, the point about it is, is that, is, is that the, you know, these great figures like St. Wolfston, he's hardly remembered. I know a historian in Bristol, Mark Steeds, has been working on this for years on publicising St. Wolfston and his great job in stopping the slave trade in the 11th century. I mean, t to be honest, it was, it, he, he did the preaching and the mob did the doing. So the, the Bristol mob went round 
dragged out the major slave traders and put their eyes out. And that's what stopped the trade in the 11th century. Now, I believe some organisations of merchants reintroduced it after that, <laughs> and um, particularly in the 17th century. Um, and people like the merchant ventures were involved in that, and that was a trade in basically grabbing anybody they could in society and putting them to work in their plantations in Virginia. Tobacco, I believe, was what they were making. And so in that period, you know, it was any old Bristolian. If you were a vagrant, if you were an orphan, if you were somebody who was vulnerable, a prisoner, if you are a prisoner of war, anybody could get their hands on. If they could get them, they'd be either indentured or forced labourers put out into their plantations. And you can see why they got so excited about somebody like Edward Colston who was helping to break open the slave trade um, you know, from the monopoly in London. That's the West African slave trade because they could get a whole more, more labour down there. So people who, who challenged this are very important. We've got St. Wollstone originally. I, another candidate is Thomas Clarkson, the great abolitionist who came down to Bristol in 1787, hung out in the Seven Stars pub, if you know it, down by Thomas Lane near Bristol Bridge tied up with all the sailors down there and found out what the content of the actual slave trade was from the mouths of those people who didn't support it, the sailors who had to work on those ships, most of whom were forced labourers themselves. So there were great figures in you know, Bristol's history we could remember, and rather than Edward Colston. And there's some great Bristolians in, just in the history of the abolition of slave trade as well. Uh, this letter that's been published, which is really um, demand, making some demands, uh, demanding the publish uh, the acknowledgements and proposed changes uh, outlined in a letter. Um, we wanted to know what changes you're going to make to the arrangements between the cathedral and the merchant venturers, publishing the service plans, sermon texts and prayers two weeks beforehand so that people can have a look, see what the bishop is about to say, and also permit independent witnesses to observe the ceremonies and see that those... Uh, plans and texts are closely followed. Really, it's uh, a kind of breakdown in trust with what the cathedral get up to with these hundreds of school children uh, on charter day in the cathedral. Uh, signing uh, the letter is Dr. Roger Ball. That's you, Roger. Also, Katie Finnegan Clark, Councillor Cleo Lake, Rosalind Martin, uh, Dr. Ben Pritchett, Mark Steeds, and you, Christine. So, can you just tell us a bit about some of the other people that have signed this? Robert? Well, we're a group that came together a year ago or so, just over a year ago. Um, to first of all look into the, the issue around the celebration of, of Edward Colston in the cathedral, that's where we started we've done an awful lot of historical research for, since then, like for example Mark Steeds in particular has been compiling a Colston casebook which is to kind of mark all the different organisations buildings, streets, paraphernalia in Bristol that's named after Edward Colston um, also we've been doing a lot of research into Colston's history just so we can get it straight and clear up a lot of the confusion that there's been or the attempts to try and wipe his involvement Can in I just it. ask you what sort of source material you've got for this? This is a long time ago. Yeah, well, we've, we've started with secondary sources. That's what people have written. So we've been through all of that. Now, for the last few months, we've been working on primary sources, both in the National Archive, but also in the Bristol Record Office as well. So we're trying to get back to the original documents and trying to uncover something which I think a lot of historians, you know, at the end of the day, they probably haven't looked at the original documents, but we have. What about some of the other figures here? Uh, Katie Finnegan Clark, or well, is Katie Finnegan Clark is one of the is, uh, one of the group who's been involved in organising the uh, website and um, uh, recently. But she she's actually an ex pupil of Colston Girls School. Um, there are a number of pupils we've come across over the years, ex-pupils, including Cleo Lake, I believe, as well, who have been very, you know, not been happy with, with the way that the school has presented itself to them as pupils and, and, and how it's presented it to, it's continued to present the school to the, you know, the history of the school to the pupils since then. So it's, it's been great to work together with different people from different parts of Bristol. Um, you know, we've, we've got to know each other through this activity. But I think the, the key thing about this is, is really to get down to the, the nitty-gritty. I mean, I've, one example of this is that there have been some concessions by the cathedral about the ceremony, the commemoration day for, for, uh, for Colston Girls School. But, you know, some of these things are a little bit lily-livered, to be honest. I mean, one thing, it was said that if the philanthropic um, history of Edward Colston was mentioned and they would balance that by talking about the slave trade. Well, to be honest, I can tell you that in the time that Edward Colston was involved in the Royal African Company, 120,000 slaves were, were transported across the Atlantic and of them about 20 odd thousand died and were thrown overboard in terrible conditions. Uh, most of them were branded that were, and uh, packed very tightly. That's one of the innovations that Colston and his managers organised. So I don't quite see how we can balance philanthropy with, with 
it's kind of mass murder. So um, I don't really think that's really acceptable. I think really Colson's got to leave the stage of history in terms of being commemorated or memorialised. Now, one of the arguments that's thrown at us a lot is that we're erasing history. Well, that's complete nonsense. I mean, if I want to go and find out about Bristolian abolitionists, I ain't going to find many statues in this city. But what I might need to do is go to the library, and that's where we spend a lot of our time. And I think take it, stop, stopping memorialising Colston is, and commemorating him is, is not a problem. If you want to find out about Colston in the future, go and look where history is, and that's in the books. Well, on the uh, one of the uh, jingles which is played on this station for quite a lot, there's uh, George Ferguson saying he's uh, predicting that the Colston Hall will not be named after Edward Colston uh, by, uh, I think it, he says by 2015 or something, round about then. But obviously he hasn't actually got the name changed, has he? Well, no, and I'm sure if, if um, Ferguson was involved in it, it'd probably end up being called the Carphone, Carphone Warehouse Hall or the Vodafone Hall or something. So, um, you know, the point about this is it's a great opportunity Opportunity if the Colston Hall's name is going to change, which is what we hear, be a great opportunity for Bristol to really make its mark here. And I think Wollstone Hall would be wonderful. What about uh, uh, the, the legacy of Cabot as well, Roger? Because this man was financed. We actually had the uh, university professor from uh, the Cabot project up at Bristol University on this show earlier this year talking about all this. And he was saying, well, look, although the Merchant Ventures were formed, something like 60, 70 years after John Cabot's voyage. They were the same families, the same people that were behind that voyage. Now, that led to a genocide of, some say, up to 100 million Native Americans, maybe, as, as uh, uh, other estimates, 75 million Native Americans. So it seems that this is another side of, uh, of, of Bristol, which a lot of people are a little bit uncomfortable about looking at whether John Cabot was actually some kind of good guy or not, effectively doing a kind of reconnaissance for a mass genocide. Well, yeah, I think that's um, it's, it's a good point. I mean, I, the thing with Cabot, is there is a kind of connection between the two, funnily enough, which, <laughs> kind of, which is to do with Brandon Hill. I mean, I don't know if you're aware, before, um, obviously, Brandon, Brandon the, um, the Cabot Tower in Brandon Hill was, was put in in, uh, in the 19th century, but I believe that um, the kind of lobby from Clifton of the, of the wealthy was they wanted actually a colossus of Edward Colston on Brandon Hill. Uh, according to the sources. Uh, what, a sort of 500-foot-high Edward yeah, Colston? a bit like Rio de Janeiro sort of thing, that sort of thing, I believe, because obviously Brandon Hill overlooks the whole city. And, um, and f- well, fortunately, <laughs> or unfortunately, depending on the point of view, we ended up with Cabot Tower. But no, Cabot is an issue as well, absolutely, and I think one of the problems is is that you know we there are some great heroes in Bristol's history that we need to we really need to to popularise now and not colonial expanders, colonial drug dealers, or colonial slave owners. Drug dealing? Surely not. Yeah, well, I mean, if I was going to target certain groups of, of wealthy people in Britain in the 19th century in particular, in the 18th, who, who basically made huge amounts of money out of nefarious activities and then gave it back maybe to the city to big up, build, big up their egos or to, you know, name things after them. Well, to bribe them to keep them quiet. Well, that's right, and um, Colston certainly uh, threw some money about in Bristol. But, um, yeah, one of the big issues is the drug dealers of the 19th century involved in the opium wars. That's basically where Britain took opium from India and fed it into China. China tried to stop that happening and there was a war, we beat them up and then uh, we got, as a result, 16 million Chinese opium addicts which made us some some very rich people in Britain much, much richer. So was Bristol in any way connected with that? Um, I'm not an expert on in Bristol, but you certainly find uh, examples all around the country. I mean, for example, up, I believe the Isle of Lewis in Scotland was bought by one of these drug dealers who then um, turfed out 3,000 Scottish crofters, made them build roads, and then transported them to America before he built his castle on the island and took it up. But I wonder whether, wonder you, whether you're going to get taught that at the Merchants Academy. I don't think you will. And, and drug dealing is not is not high on the agenda in most schools in terms of, of uh, history, but it, it should be because it is a clue to a lot of um, the British colonial past and where money comes from. So we haven't even started with the drug dealers. Maybe we'll start with, we'll, maybe we'll start with the slave traders and get onto the drug dealers next. This, this is one of the aspects of this which really bothers me, is that when you've got uh, merchant venturers running schools, they're not likely to have on the curriculum any kind of academic material which is really showing them up historically as being exactly who they are, which is effectively tyrants. Well, I think the problem is, is that they will have some 
stuff on the history curriculum dealing with slave trade, but the issue which is important is, is how much it relates to, to this city and to organisations like the Merchant Ventures. And I think you're right, I'm quite right. I doubt there'll be popularising Edward Colston as a slave trader, or that the Merchant Ventures were directly involved in it. I mean, one thing about Colston, he's a figurehead and certainly fated and a fetish for these people. But I think much more important is we have to look at the organisation Organisations such as the Merchant Ventures historically, who who, uh, who had a much bigger part to play in the slave trade than Edward Colston did in the long term. Now I'll ask you both this, you first, uh, Christine. What would you like to see happen with, number one, the Merchant Ventures, and two, with their big annual ceremony coming up in a couple of weeks, the Charter Day at the Cathedral? With the Merchant Ventures, I want them to open their books, I want them to publish their accounts so that we as taxpayers and members of the public are able to view how it is and where it is that they hold their money um, so that um, we can be confident in them as sponsors of schools and as, as you know, people running our hospitals that they do have the best interests of people at heart as opposed to their own um, capitalist um, endeavours to make themselves money. Well, hang on, because right on this very show, George Ferguson said that the Merchant Ventures give back much more to this city, and he's an ex-Merchant Venture himself. He should know than they take. Well, that's great. So let's see the books so that we're able to um, see the evidence and judge for ourselves. Uh, you know, it's all very well being told by George Ferguson or anybody else that is or was a member of the Merchant Ventures that this, this is what they actually do. But until you see the evidence, I'm afraid I'm going to continue to say that they need to open their books. Um, the second question about the cathedral... Um, the cathedral just needs to uh, go back to their scriptures, I think, and, you know, ask themselves, would Jesus, would Jesus be giving uh, buns to children that are named after a slave trader? And if the answer to that is no, then they need to check themselves and they need to do some serious reflection about what it is, the messages that they're actually putting out and whose history they are allowing to be uh, reproduced in that cathedral on that day. Because it does seem that it's a, a, a kind of private hire and the whole place is sealed off for this. I mean, when I uh, managed to get in a couple of uh, years ago uh, to record what was going on, uh, there were several attempts to eject me and they had almost like a kind of like polite female security uh, team going around making sure that nobody was allowed into the cathedral who didn't have some kind of uh, check off by them. Well, then they're clearly nervous, aren't they, about what's going on um, behind closed doors. And you've got children in there. You've got state-funded schools in there. What have you got to hide? If you've got nothing to hide and everything is legit and everything is above board, then open the doors, open your books, and let's see what's going on. It's, uh, if there's nothing to hide, there's nothing to hide. Maybe we could broadcast a service. We'll offer to do that, in fact, for free here on BCFM. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, we can broadcast it. So if you, yeah, if you uh, put your money where your mouth is, folks, and come and put it on the radio your wonderful service with these hundreds of school children anyway roger what about to, to you what would you like to see the merchant happen with the merchant venturers i know you think that they should be closed but i mean these people would have i'm sure have to do something maybe some alternative to the uh, charter that they're now operating under and then uh, your your thoughts about what should ha be happening in the cathedral well I, mean, I remember in 2007 which was the 200th anniversary of the abolition of the slave trade abolition 200 if you remember it and uh, i was at a televised debate where a person was asked a question in the audience or they, they were asking a question there was the, the question being what do you think the legacy of the abolition 200 years should be and that person said quite correctly that you know what the merchant ventures should do is disband their organization on the anniversary 200th anniversary of the abolition of the slave trade and whatever money they've got is um you take is to Pilot was going, it was 93 million quid at the time it was suggested, and that money should be sent back to the Caribbean to build schools and hospitals. So, I, you know, that's where I stand in the Merchant Ventures. I think their organisation is, is, as I said, several hundred years out of date. It should shut itself down, disband itself, and put the money somewhere useful. Um, so, I'm, I'm a bit more uh, serious about it than uh, just opening the books. So I think it's important to see what these organisations are doing. Um, on the front of what should happen with Edward Colston, well, I believe that the statue itself, for example, should be taken to a place of safety, that's into a museum, so that people can see in the future, you know, the, the strange quirks of British imp imperial history where slave traders can be fated in the middle of cities and held up as great examples of people. Um, I think the Colston Hall should be renamed, the Walt St. Wolston Hall, and then Massive Attack play a massive opening gig there, because they won't play there until the name's 
changed um, and I'd like to see other names of, of streets and buildings and organisations change so that we don't really remember Edward Colston but we remember great Bristolians who've done something good in the past. You mentioned a website where can people find this and maybe you'd like to recommend some, some books if people are interested in the history here. Yeah well, I would say you know, a good one to start with which talks a lot about, about Bristol's history and its relationship to the slave trade um, on a, from a social historical point of view and really uncovers you know, how a bunch of grubby merchants made themselves extremely rich and powerful people people um, is, is Mads Dresser's Slavery Obscured which is a really great really great book so I definitely recommend that if you can get a hold of it um, get it from the library get a second hand shot but so Slavery Obscured by Mads Dresser is a really good place to start um, there are a number of pamphlets and um, bits and pieces produced by the um, Historical Association about Edward Colson and the slave trade but I, I, I would start with Madge's book because it, it tells you all about Bristol and how that class of people came to power and website? Website is well for Bristol Radical History Group is um, www.brh.org.uk, and there's also the Counter Colston site, Countering Colston site, which has been open quite recently, which contains a lot of our research, and you can find that at. Just Google. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, I'll put a link to it on our yeah. show page, uh, thisweek.org.uk. If you go there, I'll make sure that there's a link to there. So, uh, Dr. Roger Ball. And Christine Townsend, thanks very much for joining us on The Politics Show tonight. Cheers. Celebrating diversity, this is Bristol's BCFM 93.2. But our final item tonight, uh, well, it's this chap whose uncle was a director of the Bank of England back in the 1960s and 70s. His name is Justin Walker, and you can hear more from him next Tuesday at noon on The Dialect Show. My name's Justin Walker, and uh, I suppose my journey started back in 1972, uh, a long time ago. Um, I was going back to school. Um, I was on a train. I was with my uncle. And he was Sir Harry Pilkington, later Lord Pilkington. And uh, he went to the very first Bilderberg conference in 1954. I didn't know that until only a few years ago. Uh, but I did know he was a director of the Bank of England from 1955 to 1972. And this was 1972, and he was actually going back. He was travelling down to London um, to go to one of his last meetings at the Bank of England. And... Uh, we were just talking about general subjects when he suddenly stopped me dead and he said, uh, what are you doing when you leave school? And I was only, I was only, what, 16, and I was going down to do my O-levels and stuff. And uh, he said, I'm going to give you two pieces of advice to take through life. First of all, never believe anything you read in the press because we control it. And secondly, never, ever believe a politician when they say they can do something because they can't unless we say they can. So, uh, to put it bluntly, that most of that just went right over my head, but you remembered that conversation. So, uh, anyway, uh, years to come, I joined the Green Party because I was influenced by people like Jack Cousteau and David Attenborough and um, all the people who, you know, at that time, Peter Scott, saying that the ecology of the world was being damaged and we had to, you know, humanity had to give nature a chance and we had to come up with political... Uh, ideas to, to help the environment, and I, I certainly it all sounded very sensible to me. And uh, I joined the Ecology Party, as it was then, back in 19... Oh, gosh, 1977, 78 I joined. Well, I kept thinking to myself, well, how is it that we are allowing the corporate world, the big business, to basically dominate the affairs of humanity? Now, I, I became, as you know, Tony, because I first met you, I became involved in the 9-11 Truth Movement, and we, we realized that the war on terror was completely bogus, and uh, we've been analyzing all that. But it was about five years ago, five years ago almost now, I got a phone call out of the blue from somebody who uh, said that... Uh, he was a well. He, he was his son, actually. He was his son talking to me because he said his father was extremely elderly, and uh, he said that his father had been a director of the Bank of England with my uncle, and uh, he not long for this world. But he wanted to tell me one word for me to research, and if I did, I would find all the answers to Britain's economic woes. And what was that word? Well, the word was Bradbury, and it's Bradbury Pound. Uh, that's all we've got time for there, though. Time to sign off for the Murdoch News at 7, coming up Arabian Nights.
our sister show dialect on on tuesday at noon thanks to christine townsend and roger ball i'm on twitter at tony gosling wishing you a relaxing and enjoyable weekend do please join us for the politics show at the same time next week god bless and don't let the banksters get you down Online and on your mobile bcfm is an award-winning community radio station for bristol bringing you national news on the hour live from the sky news center 